We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. So hello everyone. I see that we have, um, so welcome. Uh, <laughs> We had a, a, an issue with the, the link. We were not um, capable to, to activate the link. So I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, this is why we are a bit late in the process. Um, I see that we have three persons in the room. Uh, is that true or are there more people? Uh, okay, three, uh, three, okay. Um, and we have online, we have uh, three person. Uh, so it's uh, a round which is, um, very cozy um, and we are going to talk about um, the process we have been um, organizing and um, and deploying to, between 2017 and 2020 and that we want to um, go on working with and it's called with the internet uh, before that i would uh, propose that we do a round of presentation because we are not that many people so it uh, wouldn't take too much time and I propose that uh, maybe Maria, you you can um, you can start the, the round, and then we will see the people online, the people um, in the room. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hélène, Richard, and Raymond, who are with us online. Uh, I'm Maria Tazi. I work at Mission Publique, and uh, specifically around the We the Internet project that is led and initiated by Antoine here. And I'm also Mission Public's uh, communications manager, and I'm very happy to, to be here. Thank you, Maria. Um, I, I would go over to Richard. Hello, bonjour. Hello, I'm, I'm in Brussels. Um, I uh, represent Sementis and Le Monde des Possibles in Liège. And um, we are also partner with Eurolink, uh, the association which is present in Katowice uh, <coughs> with uh, Louis Pouzin and Chantal Le Brumont. And we have been active with Mission Publique during the consultation for with the internet in Liège. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Yes, uh, indeed, you were the, the partner for, for Belgium for that project. Um, I would like to give the floor to Raymond. Hi, good afternoon from Accra, Ghana. Uh, I'm, my entity is e-governance and internet governance foundation for Africa. We are a, a civil society that engages in internet governance, e-governance, digital inclusion, privacy, among others. So I'm here to uh, network and learn from your session. Thank you. Ah, we, I hear the movie, but I can't see it. Uh, is it me? Okay, sorry, I had sound on my side. So now let's go to the room. We have three people in the room. May, may I ask you to present yourselves uh, from the room? But I, I suppose you need to go to a microphone or have the microphone. Yes. Yes, you are me? Yes, we can hear yes. you well. My name is Chantal Le Brumont from France. And uh, I am uh, from uh, the French association Eurolink. I'm here in Katowice with uh, my colleague Louis Pouzin here. And uh, we, we work uh, a lot with uh, uh, domain names, uh, languages, uh, uh, um, uh, security, but uh, also about uh, how to have an internet uh, ethics, ethics internet. So and we, we are very uh, 
proud to to be here and we work a lot we want we want to work a lot with uh, mission public about this thank you very much um next person hello hello my name my name is ramona petuhovaite i'm from lithuania but i work for international non-for-profit organization called electronic information for libraries and i am manager for public library innovation program and we work uh, currently mostly with capacity building for public librarians in Africa to do innovative programs and digital skills training for, for um, different target groups. So I'm, I'm following you on um, social medias and I was interested to hear more. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, and we have a third participant in the room. That's Louis, no? Or that I see behind, or? Yes, it is, okay. Right. Voilà, Louis. Bonjour. Chantal and I were working in the same, <coughs> the same direction, even though we participate in the various groups which are either recent, recent or which have been created already uh, 10 years ago or more. <clears throat> so that's uh, mainly all questions which uh, are related to internet, uh, but mainly in the areas where we need more freedom, more um, attention for the institutions, and uh, it's also more universality by having a lot of partners in, in many countries. So that makes us, uh, in a way, always, uh, at, always uh, interested by uh, the groups which are created, a little bit like uh, here and here. And we are usually attended, attending their sessions and uh, make contact with the participants. Thank you, uh, Louis. So um, I'd say we are um, round, which is uh, um, little enough to, to have a, a more discussion than a, a presentation. But I think maybe it's good if, um, as I mean, Richard, you, you know the, the problem. Um, yes, and, thank uh, you. I think you know the, the process will give you some. <laughs> yes, Isha. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I tried to send you an online question yesterday, but oh. the IGF uh, website didn't work, so okay. it's not a problem. I can ask you. Yes, um, in fact, with our association, Semantis and Le Monde des Possibles in Liège, we work with um, end user for training ICTs and uh, language. Um, but now we would like to, you know, to proceed with a selection, for example, of end user or representative of refugees, etc., to participate in a consultation like you do with Mission Publique. And it's not so easy because this are uh, non-expert or sometimes they are experts, but they don't speak English, mm -hmm. etc. So uh, a good thing <laughs> with you, and we learned the process in Liège uh, with, with internet. It was good, huh? it was good uh, with good animation and good, good format. But we would like to expand with you and other partners this kind of consultation and how to proceed with end user you know, non-experts that are, it's very important in the future of uh, internet governance as such, because we want to reach also the ground, the basis of <laughs> uh, accessing internet, citizen, etc. Okay, thank you. That's a question and a remark. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, I wanted to, to propose that maybe for um, Raymond and, and Ramona, I give uh, a couple of um, key um, elements of what we've been doing. So even if you 
may have followed us on, on social media or seen a bit of information around the process that you know the, the cornerstones. And I would um, mainly then focus on the process and we could discuss about it and, and how we, we tackle that question of, as you said, Richard, um, end users um, and internet governance. Um, so I will share my screen for a couple of minutes and um, give you some elements on, on with the internet and what we've been doing in the in the past years. Um, so the, the idea we, we have with um, with the internet is to, um, to test, to improve, and um, finally to institutionalize internet governance with and for the citizens. Our starting point was that um, there, there is a, the internet and it's a global uh, phenomenon, it's a, it's a global good, um, but there is no um, corresponding, um, I mean, and we know it, uh, governance which, which fits um, those programs. So uh, models like IGF were invented, tested, and, and implemented. Our question is, uh, how do we uh, manage to bridge back the discussion between stakeholders uh, to the citizens? So this building that bridge between end users, that, that you call them, as you call them, call them, Richard, and stakeholders, decision makers. And for this, we um, developed and we designed the Global Citizens Dialogue. And we had in 2020, uh, the first edition of that global dialogue. Uh, before that, in 2019 and, and 18, we had um, run test runs and we had pilots, uh, but the real um, implemented uh, large um, implementation was in 2020. Um, we had a, a, around 80 partners at national level. We had uh, around 80 countries that participated in uh, the citizens dialogue and the stakeholders dialogue that we did in, in June of 2020. Um, and we had um, around or more than 5,000 participants in those countries. Um, and as we talk about um, end users, as we talk about ordinary citizens, for us, it's um, very important to recruit the participants so that they um, represent the diversity of their country. Uh, so as you see, our participants were half, more or less half um, female, half male, and, and some uh, neutral or other. Uh, we had a, a huge representation of people under 25, which is um, um, relevant if we compare it to the global population and the, the, the number of youth in the global population. And we had also a diversity of um, occupation uh, of the participants from uh, student and pupils to uh, unemployed retired uh, people. So the, I want to go uh, in deep into the, the detail of the, the results, I would like to um, highlight some of the more process-oriented um, results. The first one is we asked, um, and the, we asked the citizens uh, after the, the discussion, so they had to discuss so the process uh, to make it clear was um, during a full day, they had a full day of discussion. Um, they for, and they had four topics to discuss. Uh, the first one was um, internet and themselves, so who, how they uh, interact with internet, what is their usage and what they, they think about internet as a, as a whole. Then um, the question of data and uh, how they use uh, their data and how they consider that data should be handled. We had the third question was around disinformation. So the question of the digital public sphere and disinformation. And the fourth one was about um, and artificial intelligence. And we had a more open session on uh, the future of internet governance. So the, the question of governance itself. Um, when we asked people after um, the session, for example, on data, um, if their understanding had improved, and you see a huge majority of the people that um, said, okay, my um, understanding has improved. So there is a very strong learning effect of such a process uh, where they have that um, information, which is uh, compact and given to them. And then they have the capacity to discuss with other citizens. And then they, they come to uh, solutions or they answer some uh, questions or um, they answer some exercise that they have to do together. And then uh, we see that there is a high level um, of knowledge gain doing this. Also, um, in terms of attitudes, we see that um, when people go through that such a process, they um, are in the majority um, willing to change the attitude. And as you see it, some of them will want to share more data. Uh, some of them want to share le less data. Um, so you see that it's not only going in one direction, but there is a, a clear um, effect on attitudes. Um, 
Then, um, so here you have a couple of examples of the dialogue uh, in October 2020 in different countries of the world. Um, and I'd like to um, also highlight something that maybe uh, for you, Ramona, <laughs> will be interesting. We asked citizens what would be the, the good way of fighting disinformation, and we proposed them different uh, solutions. Uh, so you see that um, yeah, where the, the table of solutions and a table of stakeholders. So who should take action and who should uh, they take action? And um, the reasons were very clear. And we asked the people to uh, work as a subgroup. So a group of people take together um, and coming to a, an agreement on what should be the priority. And of course, or not of course, but very interestingly, the first priority um, is uh, education. But it's also for the people the most uh, the, the priority and the most impactful, and we asked them to to judge if this was um, the case for public bodies, for civil society Hello? organization. We. Oui? Oui, j'arrive. Hein? Vous laissez, j'arrive. Okay. Um, and for um, the um, private sector, and in all three cases, they said, okay, yes, it's a priority and it's impactful uh, for public bodies, as you see it. So it's 75% or 70% 70, 70 of the groups, so not the individuals, but the group after the discussion. Uh, yes, it's a priority for civil society. And yes, it's a priority for the private sector. And it's impactful. So it's interesting to see that for them, they see education as one of the main tools. Um, and then as a, as a maybe a last um, input on my side before we can enter the discussion, and um, we asked them if uh, citizens' dialogues should become the part of the decision-making process on the future of the internet. And clearly they said yes, uh, after that experience, that it could be a way to, um, to have that connection. Um, and I think that is the, we can um, um, stop here and enter the discussion. For me, as we prepare this session, we're thinking, okay, what could be, um, discussion and course for when we talk about that model. So we have gathered together a couple of questions, um, but at the same time, um, we ha can have a very open discussion and, and answer questions with you and understand how we, how we, how we can uh, go with the next step. But th those questions were for us maybe to inspire. Um, so who do, the reason they, do they inspire you for your strategy, for your work? Um, and what do they mean for us as a, as a community working on internet governance? And what are the, the most meaningful in relation with the IGF agenda? Um, I will stop here my presentation and I'd like to open the discussion and see what are your feedback and how we, we can pursue the discussion. So we have here, um, yes, someone in the room. I think it may be Andre. Andre, is it you? Yes, it's Andre. How are you? Hello. <laughs> uh, good, good on Anton. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice actually. to see you. Yes, I'm so and, happy. Uh, uh, I have some uh, improvements on myself. I, I'm now at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Wow, okay. And so, Very good. I am so you the uh, by the way, for the, uh, the the general public, I am the national organizer of the debates in Russia, which were, which happened uh, in October 2020. So uh, and uh, we have a long cooperation with Missions Publics, and uh, I hope uh, this cooperation will continue in in somehow. In, in our opportunities that I have in Canada, maybe. Yes, that's so. Tell me, um, how is uh, how is that Jeff in Poland? How was the week? Yeah, so it was very nice, uh, and uh, I am really glad. I'm really happy that the forum was organized in hybrid format, not totally, uh, not totally actually uh, online. Uh, and that's a really positive thing, absolutely. But may I ask, so for, for us, one of the, the question is um, how the, the results we, we produce through such dialogues resonate or not with uh, the discussion at, at GF? What is your feeling? Is, um, is something, um, or the things that are being discussed this year, are they very um, disconnected from the, the priorities that we could see citizens set uh, last year? Or are they for you something that are aligned where where you see a level of support of the, the citizens that we, we had last year in, in comparison to the discussion. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, actually the the, the, the the last event uh, i uh, attended uh, with presenting results of uh, the russian debate was in february uh, there was the week of safer internet uh, in moscow when uh, we had discussion with members of parliament and uh, i presented the results but after that uh, i was unable to uh, participate in this because i haven't what was in process of my immigration actually okay uh, yeah but uh, hey. anyway uh, i think uh, in canada but uh, feel the, the, this opportunity i'd like to i am in uh, the, the the organizing team uh, which will be uh, uh, asking government of Canada to bring the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum to Montreal in 2024. And before that, uh, I, I hope uh, uh, that will be a project maybe in Canada because uh, let's think about this. Yeah, thank you, Andre. So indeed, I saw the, the news that uh, there is a campaign to, to make Montreal the place for 2024. Um, so, the, so I mean, maybe it's time also to, to connect. No, we, we, why we do that, it's also a question of what is our middle term planning. And uh, clearly, uh, we aim at 2025 a landing point um, to understand how until then uh, we can progress and make the, the case and, and test and, and show um, that it makes sense to have that kind of um, processes for internet governance and that they could become part of the the normal way of doing internet governance by 2026. Um, I'd like to, to ask, um, so we have Richard uh, with us. Richard has joined us. Um, Richard, could you could you maybe present yourselves? Uh, so we, we have uh, an idea. So I'm Antoine and one of the coordinator of the With the Internet process. Um, yes, <coughs> I'm uh, so Richard Delmas. I'm uh, no, Richard uh, uh, Fitton. Richard, Richard ah. we, you already presented yourself, but Richard Fitton, and indeed we have two ah. Richards here. So okay. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I wanted to, to ask the other Richard to, to present himself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm Richard Fitton. I'm a family doctor in England. I've just been presenting to another international conference um, of free software for electronic health records. Um, and I joined the webinar yesterday on information governance and health. Um, my particular interest in information governance in the United Kingdom, and indeed in Europe and America really, has been the processing of personal health data, uh, mm. both by patients and by families and both by um, and also by private organisations. And I've also had some interest and followed the debate in our parliament on the use of artificial intelligence and data processing. One particular instance we had was Google DeepMind, which is a very fantastic set of software, but using people's personal information two or three years ago in a way that didn't actually perhaps coincide with the general data protection regulations of, um, of Europe. As over the last 20 months, uh, digitalization of medicine has gone at a very, very fast speed. And I understand that uh, most international organizations think it should proceed just as quickly. I've presented um, in 2016 to a conference at St. Petersburg in Russia, uh, on the requirements or oh, the hope I have for the requirement for the United Nations to be involved. I know they have lots of other responsibilities with some form of oversight of the, um, the seven or eight different standards that are involved in health data processing. They produce the, the legal standards within countries, there's clinical governance standards, there's transparency, uh, public, public discussion, and also citizen engagement uh, and understanding. That's, I've been involved with a lot in the United Kingdom because myself and three or four colleagues have been at the league of allowing, of, of, of encouraging, and in fact, helping to implement in the United Kingdom, people being able to access their own personal health data. And interestingly, during the COVID um, 
period of time because that was the way in which patients could or citizens could get their passport certificates. 18 million people have suddenly registered to get access to the records online because that's a way in which they could actually share um, their passport certificates. I have a required with a desire that there's some sort of continued international discussion about the role of the private sector and personal data. And one of the things that was said yesterday by one of the presenters um, in the discussion about health data was that maybe we shouldn't only be looking at how data collected uh, in the public sector should be shared with the private sector, but we should also be looking at how data collected by the private sector should be should be shared for the public sector. And I think that's quite an interesting, interesting discussion. Yeah. So um, that's me. That's me. And Thank I'm you. just I'll I'll I'll, I'll, un, I'll, un, I'll mute myself again. But thanks. No, for it's good. Me Richard, so. myself. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but indeed, uh, this is why also we decided to tackle the question of data and, and what it means for citizens, because this is this um, this very big question. And at the same time, so as we as we did the design of with the Internet, we we started um, with the question of, um, of in a way, who should um, own the data? That, that was the, the, the key question at the beginning. And then um, we discovered that actually the the question which is very which is behind it is how do we as a society handle data so what you said about okay in which direction um does public data goes to the private and private data to the public and how do we create something which is uh, completely new in a way because um that data economy data society is is a is a new system and how do we handle it there was a, a very strong feeling by citizens um from uh, the results we have had last year that um so per se that a data so that data drive driven society is not a bad thing so there is, um, after the dialogue, there was not, not that uh, feeling from participants that we have to avoid it, that we have to um, fight against it. But their point was, the, the big question is, how do we govern together the, the data we produce and the society? And this is where they then uh, had a very strong priority for that question of uh, multi-stakeholder governance um, and this question of inclusive governance with all actors and citizens. So the, the way they answered the, the question last year was not to um, regulate strongly or to avoid data or, um, or to, to let it go, but to understand what kind of mechanism of governance can be put in place to, uh, share, to handle together uh, that data. And that was a, a very interesting result from, from last year. Um, I wanted to, to go now to, um, to Ramona in the, in the room, and Ramona, you were saying you, you're working with the libraries. Is it for you, some, how, how does that kind of process, that kind of uh, idea resonates with you if you think about the work that libraries are doing uh, around literacy, around education? Yeah, definitely, you know, your initiative is interesting for me just because it also informs what people expect. So from data, you know, we can show to libraries that they're building digital literacy and other programs and they can consider, you know, uh, responding or addressing some issues in a way that, uh, that people think should, uh, you know, should be done. Uh, from another side, we also um, do, as I said, capacity building for public librarians. And we, one of the curriculum module that we use in our cur curriculum is design thinking for libraries. And it's also about uh, developing programs in dialogue with citizens, not just, you know, knowing what, what libraries want to, to provide, but also having, uh, citizens and, and people uh, participating from the beginning uh, in the process of program development. So th that's, you know, consultation that you did. It's also interesting for, for me, you know, how it's done. And, and, and I would like to see more um, public libraries across the world really using this, this way of uh, addressing uh, community needs and, and paying more attention to what people need. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. 
Um, so we, we saw in the, in the result from last year that people see education. So when we talk about disinformation, they see education as a, the way to go. Uh, what is your feeling about the, the capacity of um, libraries as the place to, to be one of those places uh, to tackle disinformation? Or do you think it should be done elsewhere? Or, or do you have some programs or, or work in that direction on disinformation? Actually, libraries are starting to do, um, you know, disinformation and, and um, a privacy, uh, data privacy uh, trainings for, for citizens. And um, there are different ways of really creating this program. And for example, in some, some, some European libraries were, was uh, uh, partnering with Tactical Tech and Geo based in, in Berlin that uh, is, is interested in, in those areas. And they, they developed uh, some uh, curriculum um, uh, for uh, how you, it's kind of toolbox for young people and uh, that that some libraries just you know adopt adopt this content and and use it in their programs uh, so i think it's very different in different countries because i said for some years we have focused on on uh, working with public librarians in in africa so in there they usually now like Uganda, you know, they focus on basic skills, um, digital skills provision to to their citizens, women, youth, and other other groups of people. Um, to some extent, definitely, they are touching the safety, internet safety, disinformation subjects, but it's not, you know, really very deep yet. But uh, the need in in community in society definitely is there and i think libraries will either as an independent you know training providers or together with partners in civil society or even you know private uh, private uh, providers they will definitely do more education on this Thank you very much. And um, before I give the, so Richard, I'll give you the word. And then I'd like to go to, to Raymond and have uh, Raymond, your, your feedback on, on our discussion until now, but, but uh, Richard. Yes, which, thank which you, Richard. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, so let's, I'm sorry. I, um, <laughs> so Richard, Richard Delmas. Okay. Thank you. Merci, Antoine. Okay. No, I have a, a question to Ramona because uh, we have a sub program in uh, Le Monde des Possibles in Liège, which is called Bibliosphere, which is an open uh, public library um, with an accent on multilingual. In fact, we want to have uh, public access to uh, books that are bilingual or multilingual or in language that are rare, non-used, because uh, in the end we work with a lot of diasporas and refugees. And there is also um, a library, public library like that in uh, near Lausanne and uh, also in Geneva. So my question is more about how do you in in your pub, public library do you have a system of classification or indexing or do you do in um do it in local language in english or do you use a specific format okay thank you <laughs> yeah in terms of libraries you know we uh, it's a very standardized uh, profession and classification and catalogization is like traditional uh, area for libraries. So in many places, uh, libraries use uh, universal decimal classification or DE classification. And those classifications are usually translated in, in the local languages and manuals are 
just adapt it to to but of course if we talk about uh, like smaller indigenous languages of course it's not not available in those okay thank okay, you very thank much you. thank you thank you i wanted to to go to, to raymond so raymond um I um, we had in 2018 one of the first uh, round of pilots. We had a, a partner in uh, in Ghana, um, which was the school. Um, I don't remember the name of the school now. Uh, it was an international school in in Ghana, uh, and they did with us the, the very first pilot um, of uh, with the internet in 2018. Yeah. Uh, and Ghana is um, is known to be. Uh, a very involved country in uh, internet matters and internet governance. And um, so I wanted to, to see for you, how does that um, resonate that kind of process? Or is it something where you say, okay, it's already, we're already engaging ordinary citizens in Ghana in internet governance. Um, or is it for you something that could be interesting and, and seeing, okay, the, yeah, a general feeling on, on uh, how you see that process and uh, how it could be used in Ghana. Okay, I'm not Raymond, can you hear us or are you not? Okay, I have the impression that Raymond is not hearing us. <laughs> okay, uh, Maria on your side, um, up to know the, the discussion, so you wanted to react on something? Um, well, maybe Richard, uh, Richard Fitton, you spoke about um, uh, the importance of the debate around artificial intelligence and health. Maybe uh, Antoine, you could share with Richard the results that came out from the question that we asked citizens regarding AI ethics. Maybe that yes. would be interesting, yeah. Very good. So I will um, share that. Um, so we had... Um, a session indeed on artificial intelligence. Where is that? Here. Um, and the one of the questions uh, we asked um, is what um, should um, companies or should those organizations, uh, following organization, hire uh, AI ethicists as part of their team? Um, and the overwhelming, uh, so the, the number, the percent below, it's a, it's a graphical, it's a glitch. So it's of course not 250, but it's 25, 50, 75. Um, so as you see, that uh, overwhelming majority of, uh, of participants in this, of course, they need to have um, uh, ethicists on board to uh, understand how we uh, navigate internet uh, artificial intelligence and its development. Um, and we had, um, yeah, okay, that's the, the, the key reason. And um, on artificial intelligence, another thing that um, struck us pretty, um, strongly um, when we when we looked at the results where the was the, the fact that citizens um, said that the priority for artificial intelligence should be to discuss about artificial intelligence and and have much more debate in society and within stakeholders between stakeholders on uh, artificial intelligence before we take um, really strong decision or path uh, dependencies and this was an interesting message because it was a uh, a message on the not on on uh, having more or less artificial intelligence, but um, having more discussion on artificial intelligence, its limits and uh, the opportunities it was uh, bringing uh, to our societies. Um, and that's we call we took that as a, also a call for action for us to understand how we could um, organize more of those discussion, more focused maybe uh, only on artificial intelligence and with more um, detail. Uh, so Richard Fitton. Yes, sorry. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thank you, M M Maria. One of the um, issues I've been, or we've been discussing in the last six or seven years, sometimes with the World Health Organization, um, sometimes with the International Federation of Biomedical Engineers, the European Federation of Laboratory Medicine, um, has been, as Maria said, the um, I use the word instantiate, instantiation of ethics into uh, medical record processing. And um, 
I'm sort of a bit enthusiastic, even though I'm retired. I go to quite a lot of um, electronic health technology conferences. I was in one in London, um, in Canary Wharf, just two months ago. Really nice people, very clever, but they hadn't dealt with ethics. They don't deal with ethics. They haven't sat in a, sat in a doctor's surgery talking to a 16-year-old girl who, you know, wants to have a termination of pregnancy or, or, or whatever. And I don't blame them for that. But we've sort of, a friend of mine, Martin Severs, was, um, was the medical director for the NHS Information Authority. And he was also one of the directors of the International Standard, Health Terminology Standard Development Organization at Copenhagen. So we had a lot of conversations about this. And Martin very kindly invite, got me invited to speak to the World Health Organization Family of International Classification Conference in Trieste in Italy in 2007. And we sort of teased out the fact that, and I know I'm talking about health information, personal data, that's my field. I don't deal with financial or fiscal information at all. But we reckoned that there were certain uh, rec professional record standards, and we have a professional record standard in this country, and one of the members is a very good friend of mine. Um, we also have clinical standards of maintaining records, which is clinical governance standards. Um, and then there are technical standards, security standards, but there are also ethical standards. And actually, a lot of the ethics, as far as medical records are concerned, have been very well described for paper systems and for consultation systems, they just, I say just, that's a big just, they need to be transferred into the interface between the public and the different forms of data and the different form of data processing. So I really like what you're saying, Maria. And actually that questionnaire is fantastic. I'm glad you've shown it to me again because I came in late because I've just been doing another webinar with GNU Solidarity who do free software for electronic health records around the world, which is, which, which, which is great. I think that concept of having an ethicist in those organizations and the fact that so many private sector organizations would like one is wonderful. But I, I just think that's right. And I think if people haven't had the ethical training, they're going to struggle. And I would say for my money, considering I've been interested in patients wanting to make their data available to other people and wanting it to make it to available to themselves over the years, um, it's surprising how difficult it is to get people to think through through those particular issues and as i've struggled to get people to be involved in, in their own records you think blimey you're not interested in your own health records if that's your life your life expectancy i find it quite entertaining um, and, and a little bit funny that although people hadn't really wanted to access their medical records even though it's about what's going to happen to them and what they can do when they needed to get a passport certificate, 18 million people, a third of the population, suddenly registered to have access to their own records. There's somehow there's a there's a set of stories somehow which we have to get. And interestingly enough, Maria um, and Antoine, I um, when I was working with patients, I built a med patient centre, medical centre over 20 years ago to do exactly this to train patients. And I produced I had a cartoonist. In the, in the surgery, who I still work with, and we produce simple diagrammatic illustrations of the abstract concepts, but we put them into a visual format. Um, there's very good evidence now, well, it, it's not even evidence, it's just fact, um, that when you look at the literacy of the population, that we need only 3% of the, 3 to 4% of the population can understand the standard sort of government scientific text, legal text we produce. But 20, mm -hmm. probably 25% of the National American Literacy Survey in 19, or 2003, 25% of people couldn't recognize the name of a country in a piece of text if you gave it to them. It's nothing, they're really nice people, but actually they can't do it. They don't have the literacy skills. And then the next 20 to 25% pretty much the same. So when we do have conversations, we have to have conversations through people they listen to, maybe YouTube or, or maybe cartoons or something like that. But they have to remember, I think, that the issue for me seems the people who make the policies. I recently transcribed a series of World Health Organization evidence to policy uh, webinars. How do we get research? How do you decide what research to do about COVID? How yeah. do we decide um, to what so evidence to every, collect? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, I mean, this is related to the um, one of the key uh, principles of the, the dialogues we are uh, 
implementing that question of how do you uh, create the bridge between a, a, a very in deep uh, technical discussion and a very broad, uh, easy to access discussion, but nonetheless um, do that work of translation, considering that um, every person on earth can be competent to decide if they get the right information, if they get the right frame to do that and take that time to discuss. And that's uh, the key, uh, let's say, um, condition of our, our conviction we have by doing those dialogues. I'd like to go uh, last time um, through the, the room uh, in Katowice and ask uh, Andre um, if you have some, some comments um, or um, from the other participants um, before we, we close that round and um, yeah, let you uh, navigate in Katowice further. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, but I think uh, this dialogue uh, should be continued. Uh, uh, and uh, I appreciate this approach to the librarians because first of all, uh, I have some, some experience with information for all program uh, and the Russian Committee of Information for All program of UNESCO. And uh, I think uh, this participation, this involvement is really important. And uh, I think this project should be developed in that direction. Uh, because I, I know that work, that information for all, uh, is doing for that, for the information literacy, for the libraries. Uh, for example, the EFLA as well is also a very important actor in internet governance in general. And uh, I think we, we are going in the right direction. We should uh, congratulate each other with uh, our successful efforts in uh, involving citizens in internet governance. And I hope uh, when pandemic ends, we'll, we will uh, continue our debates, which will be in person. And I hope to see you all uh, actually in this, in, 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 in this room, <laughs> but not in Zoom. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Andre. And indeed, we have plans for, for next year. We want to reboot um, the, the process and um, and understand how we can um, prepare uh, 2025 by having activities already in 22 and um, a, a major new cycle of dialogues in 2023 or 2024, but at the latest, because if we want to have meaningful results for 2025, it needs to be um, included in the discussion in 2023 uh, so that we can work uh, towards 2025. Uh, Richard Delmas, uh, last comment, and then we can um, close the round. Yes, no, you're right. I think <clears throat> Andrew was right also that the question of duration of the consultation, because I remember when I was at the European Commission managing uh, a platform ICT partnership of end user interfacing with the standardization uh, bodies. But the question is, you know, you have to su sustain the, the interest and participation. And if you want to go up to <laughs> 25, 20, uh, 23 uh, uh, governance, you know, you, you have to maintain a certain pace of, uh, you know, interest and consultation. And your role is very important as a bridge uh, in passerelle uh, mm. between, uh, and, that's not easy, but that could be done and that should be done. Otherwise, it's not real internet for all. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you and thank you everyone for your participation. In Katowice, have a nice rest of uh, day and week and uh, end of IGF. Um, so thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, thank you very much, dear colleagues. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.